February uh, 1st that they decide to throw in the towel on that, uh, claiming that uh, it's all low dose. And I'll speak with you further about that later, but I really want you to hear from Steve, okay? Absolutely. Tell us what you witnessed, what you did uh, in the operation trying to help the Japanese. Well, you know, everybody, everybody's job was different as far as who did what, who worked where. You know, my, my position while I was out there, I was actually an administrative officer for the air wing, the carrier air wing that was embarked on the Reagan for that particular deployment. So it was a scheduled deployment. We were already out on deployment, and we were actually heading to participate with an, in an exercise, and we actually got diverted from the exercise, got diverted up north to go participate and, of course, help out the citizens of Japan following that 9.0 earthquake and tsunami that ravaged their shore. So, so you were there super early. How long after Fukushima reactors uh, blew up a few days into it were, uh, were you on site? Uh, the earthquake and tsunami hit, on the, if I remember correctly, on the 11th of March. And if I remember right, we arrived on the 12th of March. Wow, and because the reactors didn't go right away. That is simply you know, amazing. Five hours. I, I, forgive me for interrupting, but former uh, Prime Minister Naito Khan revealed to the Japanese Foreign Press Corps uh, that the um, meltdown of reactor number one occurred five hours after the earthquake. He measured it from the earthquake at 2.46 p.m. local time. Yes. And the tsunami happened about 45 minutes later. But they knew that they were in a loca. They knew that they had loss of coolant. They knew that they were heading to a meltdown, and they had a meltdown five hours later before these first responders showed on the scene. And then it kept going on for days, and then the big Mach 3 blew up. That was the one that yeah. sh shot the mushroom cloud in the air so far. Amazing. Yeah, and they were cooked for five hours in low, what what uh, is claimed by those in charge as being a uh, low dose, and you can get as much by eating a banana or from just, uh, you know, taking a, a plane ride or something. That's right. Tell How us, tell like us the long and short of it. I mean, you guys, uh, you know, these sailors, everybody tried to help with Fukushima. You got radiated. And, and, and the big crux here, as I was reading the news, is that then your radiation levels were going up, so they stopped testing you? Tell folks what happened. Um, well, the the story that they've been peddling, or that's been peddled for the past three years, is that there were that there is no threat to the radiation levels that were that anybody was exposed to, and that you can actually get more radiation exposure from one month's worth of rock, sun, and soil, or a transcontinental flight. So that now today, you know, it doesn't it doesn't sit well. I can say at least for me, it doesn't sit well. It doesn't. It's not that easy to push that I believe button uh, because of the measures. Some of the measures that were taken while while the ship was out there. Sure. I mean, well, they admit you this know, is much worse than Chernobyl, and it's ongoing. So, so what did you do in the mission? How close did you get? And then when did you guys start to feel sick? Uh, well, we were. If I remember correctly, you know, I wasn't my job per se. You know, I'm not a navigator or anything like that. All I can go is, you know, what we were told. So at one point we were within pretty uh, close proximity to the plant. And as Paul mentioned, sitting for five hours, we actually sailed into the nuclear plume and was in the plume for a little over five hours. So the, and then another, on a subsequent time, we actually had to secure the water system because we actually sucked up the contaminants into the water system of the ship. And everybody who knows something about the ship, that's how that's how we get our drinkable water, our potable water. So everything we use from showers, water faucets, soda machines, water for cooking, it's all coming from seawater. And what is so, the point in your missions of, of, of sailing through the plume? That, you know, that's a very valid question. Um, you know, that's definitely a question that I don't have an answer to. You know, I'm not. Sure, sure. I mean, and, 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 and so you guys are suing, saying you've got radiation sickness. When did you start to f see the symptoms? Uh, well, it, it was November of 2011 after I had returned. You know, apparently I was having some issues on the ship and I really didn't think much about it. 
as far as GI type issues, and I don't really think anything about it. November of 2011, I started feeling uh, feeling ill. At which time, I was actually driving into Arlington, heading to work. I was driving down Route 50, and I actually blacked out and drove my truck up on a curb. So after that, it was um, back and forth to the doctor, test after test, couldn't figure anything out. I started running uh, fevers. I was running fevers for three months solid, um, as high as 102.9, um, in and out of the hospital three different times for admittance into the hospital. Uh, lymph nodes start swelling, dealing with severe night sweats, lost 20 to 25 pounds completely unexpectedly, uh, wiping hair off my body as I showered. Uh, and then during the second hospitalization, I was actually standing up and my legs just buckled. And then now I started, and then from there, it started dealing with muscle weakness, progressing up. And now it's uh, taken a, t- a point where it now affects my the signals between the brain and the bladder. And I have to catheterize every four hours now. Good Lord. Classic yeah, radiation. Wheelchair dependent. Classic radiation sickness. Uh, symptoms and of course Japanese children are dropping dead everywhere. People are having heart failure. Their teeth are falling out. Same same type of stuff you've been going through with the bleeding and the and and the uh, not having control of the bladder. And of course the response is that nothing's going on. Correct. As of right now, there's there's been no doctors able to. Well, I don't want to say able to, but at least willing to make the connection. In fact, I've actually had. Uh, The first time I was hospitalized, I actually brought it up to the intern, and the intern's response to me was, well, if this was radiation, you would have seen symptoms long before this. Uh, My response back to him was, I'm no doctor, but you need to go back to med school because you're an idiot. Well, let's talk to your lawyer, Paul Garner, real quick. I do see that Congress, the uh, Navy Times is reporting, is is investigating sailors' exposure to Fukushima radiation. Uh, but I mean, you know, my whole point is anybody in the military or the police for that matter should understand that when stuff melts down out of hand, almost every time they deny people were exposed, just like the nerve gas in the first Gulf war, 24,000, uh, chemical detectors went off and they still just said, no, nothing happened, even though it killed large numbers of people years later and has been, and, and has now been confirmed uh, talking to your attorney, Paul Garner, why do you think they have this attitude? I mean, clearly your client and others on the ship and ships are, are, are showing classic forms of radiation sickness. What's been the train of events the last three years? They Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, they control the, uh, the ball game. They control the media. They control the misinformation that's disseminated from day one from Fukushima Gate. If if you were at the nuclear power plant on day one, March 11, 2011, and you were in charge of the power plants and having to deal with the meltdown of reactor number one, number two, number three, and the potential to have to say, hey, we have to walk away from this because you'll have to evacuate Tokyo, Japan. So here here's the dynamic. The guy who was in charge is now dead from cancer their own guy. So I don't care what Nuke Abe, their present prime minister, may be pushing to the world. No one has gotten sick from Fukushima and no one ever will. Well, just take a look at the guy who's in charge of, uh, you know, your uh, uh, TEPCO, your Tokyo Electric Power Company. You're a big shareholder. You're number one shareholder in it now. The guy's dead from cancer. Hello? So they're in control, Alex. They don't have... Uh, we don't have info wars uh, at our disposal on mass media. If mass media paid attention to this like I did after it first happened and stayed on it like they should have, but they're captured. They're all captured by the nuclear industry from the top down, from your commander-in-chief right on through to the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, it's all money making. That's right. Terrain. That's right. Their propaganda is so good. Uh, of course, the Ronald Reagan's nuclear powered. Last time I checked, and you know, I've always been a pro nuclear power guy because I mean, I believe we need energy. The problem is none of them work these things right. They build them on fault lines. 
when they blow up, they don't even seem to care. They're not even trying to fix it. There's just this attitude that they're in control of the BS machine so they can lie to themselves and everybody else, but they're not in control of the reactors. You know, the laws of physics will not respond to TEPCO's bull. So where is the lawsuit going and how do we support you guys? Okay, here's where it's going. We're refiling before February 6th is the deadline that Judge Janice Sammartino afforded us to file our second amended complaint in federal court in San Diego. We had 51 victims. We expect to double that figure of record. And, and we've been contacted by probably a quarter of a million, um, well, 250 a uh, quarter of 250 victims, but there were, as you mentioned at the top of the program, thousands involved in this. Now, there's a latency period, as we know, but we have filed on behalf of all John and Jane Doe's who participated in Operation Tomodachi to preserve their rights so that they can file a claim in the future when something arises. With Steve, we know what's happened. With several others, unfortunately, it's the same scenario or beyond. Uh, constantly bleeding from your butt or from uh, gynecologically, and you're a young person and not at 21 you lose yep. a, a, uh, one of your testicles. So we, we're going to push this forward. As you mentioned, Congress is going to uh, get a report back from the Undersecretary of State in charge of this by April 15th, but we're not waiting for them because where right. have they been? And by the way, folks, where for those that been? don't know, radiation attacks fast-growing cells, so your gums, your intestinal lining, and uh, sailors across the board that were part of the operation have been reporting bleeding from their rear ends. So just understand, this is not a game. That means you've got serious radiation sickness. And what makes me mad is they didn't tell people take iodine from what I read. Perhaps the sailor can correct me. Uh, but uh, why not tell them to take iodine? Why not tell them now uh, that there's things like Prussian blue and things that could help strip this out of your body or chelation? I mean, why were you told any of this, Lieutenant Simmons? They don't want no, to admit no. that there's a problem. It's denial. It's denial. No, no, it's like telling the first responders, don't wear respirators, the air is fine on World Trade Center. I mean, it's beyond just not caring and covering up. They actively don't want you to get any aid or protect yourself. They'd be saying, go down 1,000 feet in the water. You don't need a mask or a tank. You don't need air down there. I mean, it, it's, it's just, go back to that briefly. So, so they never told you to protect yourself from radiation. You had a wonderful. Well, they, uh, they also. You had. The I'm sorry, Steve. I just want to. I just want to say this to Alex, Glenn Troltz, your uh, guy who you had on the other day, Glenn Troltz, who got measured for cesium. He's got cesium in his body. How much cesium do you think Steve Simmons has in his body? Well, you must be a listener. Yeah, we had one of our crew on who had his blood tested because he moved from California because he was sick. He had very high levels of cesium that they said was from Fukushima in the major medical report from a major medical lab in Chicago where his blood was sent. And uh, exactly, we, we need to get the test of your whole crew. Uh, it's just amazing. So so to be clear, Lieutenant Steve Simmons, who was on the Ronald Reagan uh, aiding uh, through the plume right there at Fukushima, uh, you guys were, you were miles away and responded when the, when the tsunami hit and then came in. Uh, tell us about, I was reading that you guys were told that there was increased radiation, but then when it started going up and up and up, they said, don't worry about it and stop testing? Uh, honestly, that is, that's new information to me. Um, that is not information that I was purview to, I should say. Sure, sure. Uh, what about iodine? Did they tell you to take potassium iodine? The only individuals that uh, were taking the potassium iodine were those directly involved with flight ops, those going ashore, and potentially some of those that were uh, working on the deck, but that was it. The rest of the crew... Nothing. So you're talking a crew of about 5,500 people, and a small amount of them were working on the deck or actually going ashore. And by the way, you're you're living in and around a nuclear reactor on the ship, because I'm uh, that's a nuclear powered carrier, right? Correct. Okay. So did they not have enough potassium iodate or iodine for you, or what happened? Well, I'm quite sure they had plenty. Um, however, you know they're going off of misinformation coming being fed to them from Japan and from Tokyo Electric. 
So when Tokyo Electric and Japan gives the false sense of security that everything is everything is fine and you guys are safe to off.